Hello everyone and welcome to the Game Engine programming series where we write a game engine from scratch. I'd like to start by saying a big thank you to everyone who is encouraging my work on the series through Patreon. Your support is greatly appreciated. And today I'd also like to give a special shout out to Alexandru Yanku, who's been a longtime supporter of the series and now has joined the respectable band of tribal elders. Thank you so much for your generous support. We have now the ability to save and load texture assets after importing textures. In this video, we are going to make it possible to open texture assets in a viewer, where we can also pan and zoom in on the image. At this point, we can double-click a texture which causes a window to open with a pink background. Our mission for today's video is to display the imported texture as well as add the ability to pan and zoom in and out of the image. The texture is already loaded when set asset is called, so all we need to do is generate bitmap sources for WPF to be displayed in the texture editor. For this, we need a 3D array of bitmap sources. This array is populated by taking each texture slice and convert it to an image that can be displayed by WPF. We'll also keep an array of slices which is owned by the texture class here. It will be a copy when the loaded texture has a BC format. In that case, we are going to decompress each slice and put it in this array, so it can be used for generating bitmap sources. Obviously, we can't use block compressed slices directly for this purpose. This array will be a reference if the slices are not compressed, in which case we can use them directly to generate the bitmaps for display. Since the editor should be able to display any of the slices, there should be another property for the selected slice bitmap. For now, let's just take the first slice. Later, we'll add the ability to select a specific slice. We do the same for the selected slice. Now we need to generate these bitmap sources. This is done after the texture is loaded, where we call another asynchronous method. As I mentioned, when the texture is compressed, we need to decompress the slices. However, we haven't yet written the decompress API methods, so I'll comment this part out for now. Of course, it's rather unnecessary to take a reference on a different thread like we did here, but decompressing a texture can take a few seconds, so in that case, it should run on a separate thread. We are now ready to actually generate the bitmap sources, for which I just added a new method. Here we clear the array of slice bitmaps and use a triple loop to populate it with generated bitmaps. Now 
we can call the same method that we used when creating icons. This time it just returns a bitmap source which is added to this array. Next, we need to notify the UI that it should update the displayed image according to which slice the user has selected. This is done by raising a property changed event. I see I made a typo here, so let me fix it. Ok, now we are ready to display the selected slice in the texture view. For this we can simply add an image and bind its source to the selected slice bitmap. And here we see the imported image, which is definite proof that our texture importing code works correctly at least to create the top level MIP map. As we continue this series, we'll hopefully gather more proof for the correctness of our hard labor. I'd like to add pan and zoom functionality next. Therefore we need two new properties. The first one is the pan offset, which is simply the measure of how many pixels the background was panned with respect to the origin. The second property is the scale factor, which is used for zooming. Don't forget to set a default value of 1, otherwise it will default to 0 and we won't see any picture. In order to zoom in and out, we can bind the scale transform of the background grid directly to the scale factor. I had another typo here that caused problems with autocomplete. Now the properties are being recognized. Next I can put the image in a canvas and bind the canvas top and canvas left attached properties to the pan offset. Let's try this first with a rectangle which will be used as a background for images that have transparency. We bind canvas left to pan offset x and canvas top to pan offset Y. The size of the rectangle will be the same as that of the image. I'll use a checker background image to fill the rectangle. So let's add a new folder in the resources folder for texture editor and copy the checkerboard image in here. I'll use an image brush which can be used as a tiled background with the checkerboard for each tile. Then we do the same with the texture image. I might merge these two canvases later and just use one, but let's see if it works first. Let me also remove the pink background. We are going to use the mouse for pan and zoom functions. So moving the mouse while holding down the right mouse button will pan the canvas. Scrolling the mouse wheel, we'll zoom the image. I'm going to attach event handlers for mouse right button down, mouse right button up, mouse wheel and mouse move events. One of you once told me how to generate all these methods at once and now I forgot and I'm sorry that I have to press F12 to add these one by one. We need the mouse click position in order to calculate pan offset. I'll also add a boolean field that indicates if mouse right button is captured.
As always, I move the constructor to the end of the class unless I forget to do so. When the right mouse button is pressed, we record the position where it clicked and capture the mouse. Capturing the mouse makes sure that this control will continue receiving mouse events, even if the mouse pointer has moved away and is no longer on top of the control. When the right mouse button is released, we also release the capture. We need to calculate a new pan offset when the mouse pointer moves while the right mouse button is pressed. First, we subtract the mouse previous position from its current position. We then scale this offset by the inverse of the scale factor and add it to pan offset. Finally, we update grid click position to be the mouse current position. For zooming, we use the sign of the mouse wheel delta to calculate a new scale factor. This scale factor is always 10% larger or smaller than the current scale factor. We call a zoom function which will also calculate a new pan offset, so that the pixel where the mouse pointer is currently on top of will remain at the same position. This way we can use the mouse pointer to zoom in on any specific part of the image as we'll see shortly. I'd like to set the scale factor only if the new scale factor is different from the current one. I'll add another extension method for comparing double precision floating point values. So we return if the two values don't differ significantly. Otherwise, we set the new scale factor. This will cause the texture view to update its scale transform. I decided to set a minimum zoom value of 10%. So if the image is scaled to one tenth of its size, it won't go any smaller. It's of course up to you what value to set for this minimum, or even if you want to limit the scale factor in any way. The next step is to change the pan offset. To do so, first we scale the mouse position back with the old scale and scale it to the new scale. Then we calculate the difference between the new position and the original one, and scale this difference by the new scale as well. This is the offset that we need to add to pan offset in order to keep the same pixel at the mouse pointer on the same position while zooming. Let's see if this works. Well, something is not right here. On line 23 it says, Apparently, it can't find the checkerboard image for some reason. I'm going to also include it as a resource, which we should do for everything in the resources folder. That didn't seem to help though. Hmm, I'll double check and make sure I didn't make a typo somewhere. It doesn't appear to be the case though, unless I'm being extra dyslectic today. Well, this isn't that important for now, so I'll just comment it out and deal with it later. Okay, now it doesn't crash, but it also doesn't detect my mouse events, and that's because we don't have a grid background, so we can set it to transparent in order for it to participate in hit detection. And now when I try to pan the image, it kind of freezes and doesn't react to the mouse anymore. I'm not even able to move the window. Let's try again. So at first I can move the window, but as soon as I right click, it freezes and won't let me do anything else. Obviously this is a problem, and the great thing about having a problem is that we can completely ignore it and focus on something else. Isn't it amazing how problems will go away if you wait long enough? 
So yeah, let me clean up this code a bit and see if I can think of something in the meanwhile. We want this control to have the focus in case we want to use the keyboard for zooming, so I'll add a couple of event handlers that give it the focus. I'm not sure if they are really needed here, but we'll see. I can always remove them again. When the pan offset is updated, we want to always remember its previous value. This is needed in order to shift the background of the texture view, as we'll see in the next video. For now, I just attach an event handler to data context changed event and update the old pan offset. This seems a bit unnecessary, but we'll add more code to this in the next video. Okay, let me try again and see if I can find what the cause of our mouse problem is. This time I can see right away what's wrong with the code. Here we are capturing the mouse with respect to this control, which is the texture view. However, the event handlers are listening to the events from the grid, and since the mouse events only go to the control that captured the mouse, the grid wouldn't get the events, and therefore the event handlers are no longer called. And that goes for everything in the application that listens for mouse events, including window resize and move operations. That's why I couldn't do anything as soon as I pressed the mouse button. Capturing the mouse for the sender of the event, which is the grid, should solve the problem. And here we are able to happily pan around and zoom in and out. Nice. The final issue is the fact that, for some reason, our checkerboard image cannot be found. So I'll just copy paste the path to this image, just to be sure that I didn't make any typos. I mean, I still can't see any, but you never know. And now it works. I have no idea why it couldn't find the image before, but now it does. So happy, happy, joy, joy. We can also have a look at the checker background by temporarily setting the opacity of the image to a lower value. Here we can see the checker pattern and it does zoom in and out with the rest of the image, which is not really what I want, but I'll probably fix that in the next video as well. I think we did enough damage for today, so this is where I'd like to stop. We are going to add the ability to select different MIP levels, an array or depth slices in the next video, on top of enhancing the interface a bit more. We'll also write the decompression API methods so that we can also view the textures that use block compression formats. As always, thank you for joining me and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please feel free to like and subscribe. If you join me on Patreon, you'll get access to the code on GitHub so you don't have to type everything over from the video. Plus there are also other nice goodies and rewards exclusive to my Patreon supporters. Please use the link in the video description to check them out. I hope to see you next time, until then take care and happy game engineering!